Good afternoon, everybody. It's very good to see you all. And uh, this is the second part of uh, a series on our consciousness. First, we talked about uh, therapy and meditation. And if you remember, or you've seen it online, um, therapy and meditation are two very different animals, but they are grazing on the same field. They have a lot in common. But if you look at the Western way of therapy, you always have two people, the therapist and the client or the patient. And the next thing you see that in meditation you are either on your own or you have a group of people doing the same meditation. So in the East you do things basically within yourself, within your own consciousness. And in the West, you project the teacher into a person. Now, of course, there are complementary practices in each case. Like in the Orient, you go to a teacher and you have conversations, sometimes Dharma combat or Sun Moon Tap with him. And in the West, you also have sometimes introverted and uh, solo meditation practice as well. However, the two views are very different. One is that in the Orient, we believe that the ego is an illusory thing. And we don't try to fix it. We actually try to bring this illusion down or take it away. And somehow that has a healing effect. Not just in the Orient, but that's what we found in the West. In the West, we believe that uh, the ego is something very firm the foundations of it cannot be changed and uh, you just have to patch it or fix it with certain practices usually these interactive cognitive practices so that the analysis of your eye would bring better results in the west traditionally uh, analysts and therapists do not believe that the foundations of yourself can be either changed or attained in the orient uh, very few people believe that patching up your ego with certain good thoughts or positive thinking or some kind of emotions would bring about fundamental differences and results. In the West, many times, people try to kind of reverse engineer meditation to serve something else than the original purpose of that meditation. You can see it in many instances. And of course, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because meditation, if you take it out of its original context and you try to apply it to serve something else than the original purpose, will always bring about dubious or mixed results. What is the original purpose of meditation? To wake up and by this awakening help this world. What is the purpose of therapy? To fix you. First, to identify what kind of sickness you have or mental problem you have and apply the necessary method to fix you. But it doesn't really wake you up. It doesn't alter your fundamental views on the world and yourself. You just get fixed. Various views and techniques and etc. is applied in the therapy process. And if it takes uh, long enough and it goes deep enough and you have uh, a good therapist, you can have your uh, mental deformation or mental illness uh, or just psychological problem fixed or removed. You may feel there's a common area here, but if we don't approach this carefully enough, we can run into several problems. And one of them is that we misunderstand the purpose of either therapy or meditation. And that would be a grave error. So we should see them first in their own context. What was the origin of therapy and how it was supposed to work before Oriental influences altered it? Likewise, what is the purpose and origin of Sonbulgyo or Zen meditation? How it originated, how it worked in the Orient before Western influences started to alter it? And of course, you don't have to go back to the historical beginnings. You don't have a whole lifetime to study history. You have to get down to business and solve your own task inside. 
But the real question is not of authenticity. Both are authentic in their own way. Our approach might be correct or incorrect. But what is the key question and the topic of today's talk is what is the way to open up your mind? What is the key that opens up the locked door of your hidden powers or unforeseen karma or unprocessed problems? What is that? And these hidden potentials and unfinished karma all reside in what we call subconscious. The Orient does not have this same boundary between conscious and unconscious or subconscious as the West. In the West we have been separated from our true nature for so long that we had to rediscover it. There are schools to rediscover that we have more than this thinking mind, than this conscious conceptual mind. In the Orient that was never lost, but we talk about unfinished karma or unseen karma, unconscious karma, and something that you are already consciously using. The manifestation of this is very clearly described in the traditional Buddhist view of the mind. And I start with that because I work with that more actively. And for me, it's a more functional concept of what we are as a human being, body and mind together. So as you know, in the Buddhist view, we have the eight consciousnesses. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. That's the first five, the functional, physical five. And then we have the sixth consciousness, which is the thinking mind, the conceptual mind. So this sixth consciousness is actually what gives names to things. That's what calls this a glass, or water, or drinking. The seventh decides whether this water is hot or cold, good or bad, uh, enough or insufficient. And then the eighth actually is your storehouse consciousness, your long-term memory, where you store everything, all your previous lives, all your sensory inputs, Everything that the first seven consciousnesses do is stored in the eighth and sometimes recalled and sometimes just left there until some trigger comes from the outside or from your inside and then memories become active. We call that sometimes deja vu but even as you use your words or listen to this talk you are using your eighth consciousness as well not just the first seven. But in this eighth consciousness is basically everything that we don't know about, but belongs to us. In fact, the seventh also has tendencies of judgment. So the way we think, the way we judge, the way we remember, so the sixth, seven, and eighth consciousness, it's all together what we call the mental body. When we are born, it starts to work throughout our brain. The first five works throughout our senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, the sense of touch. But the six, seven, and eighth works through the brain and various other centers that give us information, cognitive information, emotional information, many kinds of information. So as children, we start to think, we start to form words. Very soon we decide whether the person next to us is somebody we like or we are afraid of. Very early child memories come up. And then even more memory comes. And then the seventh, which is the duality maker, creates the notion of I or the ego. So that's me and that's not me. That's the world or that's someone else, but that's me. So because we are bound to this body, we identify with the bodily being first. In fact, we have a hard time learning it. You know, dogs are house trained way faster than children. It takes longer for us to learn how to take a pee or take a poop or feed ourselves and take care of ourselves physically than to any 
animal species on this planet. Doesn't that make you think where we are from? Are we really such masters on this earth? Or we are just guests who really forgot where we came from? So pretty much of our karma is unconscious. It's stored in the eighth, in the big hard drive or the big server of our consciousness. And when we start meditation, then some of the doors that used to cover this, they open up. Then you see certain things in your mind's eyes, in your great mirror, that you have not known about. And sometimes the experience is very happy. If your seventh consciousness decides to be happy about it, then it becomes happy. But if it's something you didn't want to see about yourself or know about yourself, then it's very sad. That's not me. That's impossible. That I would think like this. That I would have this in my storehouse. That I would remember that. I didn't do that. Etc. Etc. Or sometimes we want to see things that are not there. We try to imagine so much that we are a good person. That we are this. We are that. They call that dreaming. But this kind of dreaming is actually building ideas. And once we talk about the subconscious, we have to understand that the Western discovery of the subconscious was related to dreams. That's where Carl Gustav Jung is fantastic and his work is indispensable now, not just in the West, but also in the East. Because the way you see your own dreams and the way you interpret your meditation experiences, that's pretty similar. So when your doors to the subconscious are not open and you don't perceive yourself, you don't perceive your karma, then how do you get the message that something needs to change? That there's something more than just up here, your dream. And these dreams are not the kind of heavy dinner type of dreams. These are dreams that your subconscious sends you because you somehow don't see it in any other way. So either you see it in meditation, either you perceive it directly in a wakeful state because you have opened up the gate, or somehow during your sleep time, your mind sends you an email with a picture, or an MMS, or posts something on your own Facebook, okay? Something you have to see. What we fail to understand many times that our subconscious and our conscious mind follows the same rules. If we don't see that, then we believe that we have a bunch of animals inside of us, or a bunch of gods, or a bunch of other kinds of beings, and we are just sitting on the top of it as the conscious human being, that 5% we call conscious mind. And the 95% is the jungle or the desert, whichever way you see it. And neither of these extremes are true. Experience teaches you. So that's why when we have this deep question, what am I, it actually acts as a key to this gate, and this gate of not knowing. Because why do we say not knowing? As long as your sixth consciousness moves, you cannot open this gate. As long as your seventh consciousness moves, you cannot open this gate. As long as you consciously try to remember, you cannot open this gate. So we say, you have to have your sixth, your conceptual thinking, unmoving. And you also have to have your seventh consciousness unmoving. That means not judging. And also you have to have your eighth unmoving. That means the conscious memorizing and recalling. You also have to have that completely unmoving. That's why we say not moving mind or don't know mind. And how do you do that? How do you stop the wheel of the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth? That's why we use the huadu. That's why you ask this question, what is this? And after a while, when you stop verbalizing the question, and the words of the question disappear, but the question remains there, 
Then the sixth and the seventh and the eighth, they all stop moving. And that's when your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that's when the difference between your conscious and subconscious begins to disappear. Now that sounds scary, I know. What happens is that you begin to perceive. You don't perceive more than you have to. Like I said with the dreams, there are always subconscious contents emerging to the surface, wanting to show themselves. But if we close down the sixth and the seventh, we have too many sensory perceptions from the outside. We think too much, we judge too much. Then we don't get the deeper message. And that's what we call being bound to illusion. Illusion because we believe that that's it, that's reality. But it isn't. In fact, we have more of it than we think or see. And that's not the only way to perceive this universe. It's just one way, through the senses. So the question or the quadu is supremely important because it's like one key to three locks of the same safe. No thinking, no judging, no conscious memory. And then the safe opens. What do you find in there? I won't tell you. But one thing I can tell you, that the moment you open the three locks, the safe box disappears. Your ego disappears. Your little treasured self that you believe is so important disappears. And inside and outside become one. So imagine when we talk about the Huadu without words, that this water, which is now in a glass, could stand without a glass. Imagine that, use your imagination. So just like that you can keep the question without repeating the words of the question. And the reason is that if this water could remember what it is to be in a glass and could memorize it really well, then even if you take the glass away, the water would still be hanging in the air, not losing the glass form. So why do we need this? And how could we use this really well? You may say, I'm fine. Yes, we are mostly fine. Especially those who are sitting in this room, having time this beautiful afternoon, not having to work, not having to be with your family, not having to maintain your earthly status in this world. We are lucky, we are fine. But the real question is, are you satisfied with just knowing maybe 5% of yourself which you can consciously think of? Because that's about the ratio. But sometimes you have these big internal shocks like earthquakes, which we really cannot foresee or forecast. Mind quakes and earthquakes are pretty hard to predict. Wouldn't we have to use at least some probes to understand ourselves better, to somehow see the 95% that we are sitting on that determines us many times, especially in critical situations, but we have not seen it. It's as if you have like a hundred people in the room and you only know five of them, but they're all talking to you and you somehow depend on them. You breathe the same air, you eat the same food, you drink the same water. Wouldn't you want to get to know who they are over time? So that is the big question. Because in critical times, if there is no team spirit in a group, they cannot act together. If you don't understand yourself, your own internal conflicts and crises can tear you apart. And that's the same with anything that happens to you seemingly from the world. Because that's the next issue in our talk today how your subconscious is connected to the world, to the mat seemingly material world. And now comes something that you don't have to accept, but at some level it's true, that this entire material reality is a projection of your own subconscious. Just like your mind, which you think of as mind, it doesn't stop here. But your subconscious also doesn't stop here, it's just too small for all that information. It manifests through 
this, but it's not contained in that. Remember this. This whole thing, since we see it as matter, as solid, something different from us, is our no I, is our subconscious. Now, if you read stories of great masters who went through many phases in their meditation, sometimes they could see through these things as if they didn't exist as solid matter. Or sometimes the tree was talking to the Zen master, or they had various visions that were not true. They had to pass those phases of illusions, but they realized something, that this thing which we accept as reality is just as illusory as the illusions that they saw during their meditation practice. That's the point. It's not the experience, but the result of that experience. So the, if the result of your experience is awakening, it doesn't matter what happened. As long as you stay alive and you woke up, that's it. You got the result. So this whole thing is actually a memory that we have around in this beautiful room, all the sights, the sounds, the smell, the touch, the taste. It's already a memory as you sense it. And as memory, it belongs to us. When we say, that if your mind doesn't think and we return to don't know, then your substance, your substance, your substance, all our substance becomes the same substance. It's really not some religious talk. It's an experience that you can get. But for that, you have to have the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth unmoving. If you reproduce your I, you reproduce the hindrance between you and the world, you and the other person. And that hindrance is making our dualities. That hindrance is making good and bad. So we make it out of our own ignorance. If we are not aware of ourselves, if we are not aware of reality as it is, we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Because guess what? When we die, the sixth stops working because you are brain dead, you're gone. But the seventh and the eighth wraps itself up into what we call the karma body. That's all the energy and information that you take with yourself from this lifetime to the next. And whatever the information in that karma body, that's the kind of physical body that you will get. So if you have Indian karma, you go to India and land in an Indian womb and you are born there as an Indian person. If you have Korean karma, then you are born in Korea. You have Hungarian karma, you are born in Hungary. It's very easy to see that with these labels, but if you look inside, then you find a lot of things in there. But the summary of all this points to one end point. That's your next birth. And that's why the great teachers always said, direction, direction, direction. The three most important things in your practice. Direction, direction, direction. We have tons of karma, some conscious, some unconscious. But what we should always declare and realize and follow is how we want to use all this karma. And that direction is our vow. So I talked about Hwadu as the question that opens your mind. And our great vow, either the four bodhisattva vows, or the ten novice vows, or the 250 bhikkhu, or 500 bhikkhu vows, doesn't matter. Originally there's only one vow, wake up. I vow to wake up. Whatever other vows you take with that is secondary. But either you decide to wake up, you take the red pill, or you don't, you take the blue pill, no problem. You go back to your existence and as if nothing had happened. But this vow controls then everything. 
in your mind, whether you perceive it as conscious or subconscious, doesn't matter. Because the moment it surfaces, it takes the same direction. So we have four great bodhisattvas in our homage to the three jewels. Kwan Sam Bosal, that relates to our compassion and feelings. It's a projection of our best emotional behavior. Then we have Munsu Bosal, that's a projection of our wisdom. It's the best thing we can do with our thinking mind. Then we have the Heng Boyon Bosal, who is the great action power Bodhisattva. That has a lot to do with your action, with your physical and other actions. But mostly it's physical. Then the fourth is Jijang Bosal. Devon Bonjon Jijang Bosal. Why? The great vow Bodhisattva, Jijang Bosal. That relates to your speech. So the four centers, you know, Manjushri, Jijang Bosal, Kwan Sam Bosal, and your Tanjon is your power, your action power. All the four most important parts of our being are addressed and cultivated and clarified in our Buddhist practice. If we don't do the job, it remains undone. Then there's a critical mass of anger, desire and ignorance and you say, oops, that's a little too much. What do we do about that? How do we reduce that? And then, you start to cultivate some kind of path to understand something about yourself which you haven't understood before. To see something you have not seen before. And that means you open up those gates that you have closed off before. And if you ask the right question, you get the right answer. That means directly pointing to human mind. What am I or what is this? What is the substance that becomes form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness? As we have the O on the five skandhas in the Heart Sutra. What is that substance that becomes this body? And then the feelings and then perceptions and impulses and consciousness. And how does it behave? How does it transmit itself from one lifetime to the next. What kind of energy and information do we have in there? How much of that do we see and how much of that we do not see? And I know this sounds very scientific or analytical, but we are at a university, so what do you expect? But anywhere you ask the question, you will tend to get the right answer if you asked it correctly. Why? I mentioned the great vow as something we declare or swear as an oath. That's why it's related to our speech. If we take every sentence as a vow, then our speech will get a lot of energy. And how does that begin? It begins with silence. Just like this Dharma talk began with silence. And you cannot overestimate the value of that silence. Speech power begins with silence. Action power begins with non-action. Thinking power begins with no thinking. And feeling power begins with no feeling, but I should say a clear heart. No feeling is very, very scary for a lot of people. I will be without emotions. No, sweetheart, you will not be without emotions. Your heart will be a little bit uplifted and clarified if you just don't push the button too hard. And the same thing for smart boys up here, okay? Because they can be very geek and very super genius, but when they have some Asperger's syndrome or some mildly autistic, you know, problems, then they don't realize that they are truly up in their heads and very sadly up in their heads and everything else is missing or almost missing. And that's why the Buddha's path is called the middle way. The middle way because the way we think about ourselves and this world is so dualistic that unless we find something central or the middle way, we will never come back to reality. 
the first and most important medium to show it with is light itself. What is light? Is it waves? You can measure the wavelength. You can see it as from ultraviolet to infrared. Or is it a bunch of photons? You know, the double slit experiment. You have waves, just normal light, double slit, and it becomes these stripes of black and white. So it seems that there's something differentiating there. In one stripe there are photons, and in some other stripe there are no photons. So what is light? Is it wave, or is it particle? Is it form? or is it emptiness? Is it energy or is it matter? And the answer is, as long as you think, you will never get a complete answer because your thinking breaks it down into wave and particle. Your senses, this human body and mind, break it down into what we see, hear, taste, smell, touch and think. But the problem is that outside of this body, and mind, we have no other tools for perceiving reality unless you keep complete don't know, which means no body and no mind. And that's pretty hard to imagine. And in fact, you can't, because that's what imagines. You cannot imagine the one which imagines. You cannot see your eyes, you cannot hear your ears, and you cannot model your true self. And that's why it's crucially important that you do not treat your conscious, the 5%, and the 95% unconscious as two distinct separate units. It's something that both belong to you. It's something that you can discover and something that you can transcend. Discovery is not the same as transcendence. In fact, transcendence is a wonderful viewpoint. It's like getting your spy drone over a territory. And that's a perfect way to scan that territory because you don't bump into uh, humans and objects and forests and uh, electric lines, etc., etc. So the transcendental view to perceive who we are and who we are not, that view is your golden egg, your safeguard for a correct discovery, whether it's conscious or unconscious mind. So I would like to offer the chance now to everybody in the audience to ask any questions you like. Uh, you had said that, uh, you know, our life is, whatever we do in life is our karma and then we are reborn. So are we reborn again and again and again? It sounds so tiresome. <laughs> You would know, you like to be reborn again and again and again? No, not really. Not really? I'm already tired. <laughs> ah, what makes you tired? Of doing the same old, same old, same old. Is it the same old? What, what makes you feel that is the same old thing? The routine. Ah, the routine. Yeah. So, where does your whole cycle of life and death come from? What makes you go around, around, around? I guess the routine, I don't know. Well, what makes the routine? Mm. Let me help you with something really superficial. Okay. Um, you are born again and again, right? The mm -hmm. notion of I. Yes. Uh -huh. What if we reverse this? And if you don't have this I, then there is no more birth and death. Correct. So, if you dismantle this notion of I, then probably the routine is also gone, because this I makes everything. But where does this I come from? So, if you come back to the place where this I comes from, you have control over life and death, over routine and, no and novelty. In fact, you can renew yourself so much if you go down to the deepest core of your being, that even the most routine task will not feel boring. Let me give you an example. Uh, we say rocks are cold and they are hard. And it's true. 
But if you just go 6,000 meters below the Earth's surface, you find something very different. Mm -hmm. It starts to melt. You go even more, and we know that from uh, deep mantle, Earth's mantle discoveries, then rock becomes molten. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the sun, sometimes, uh, you know, what we think of as this planet is just a huge, you know, gas cloud. Sometimes the sun ejects so much mass in a very short period of time, which amounts to the mass of the Earth. Okay? Mm. So what is it that makes it into this cold and hard rock? Something that spins around relentlessly in life and death, day and night, man, woman, child, adult. What's that? So find the center of it. And this kind of superficial help that I can give you mm -hmm. is called I. Your notion of I makes this happen. But what are you? What are we? Where does this notion and thing come from? Now you find that, you can put the rock back to its molten state. Mm -hmm. You can change it into gas. And then there's no orbit. Then there is no bondage by mass. And you see that your concepts, including your notion of I, are totally molten there. There's no name and no form at the very bottom of your existence. Your substance has only infinite time, infinite space. No form, no feelings, no perceptions, no impulses, and no consciousness. That includes concepts. And then the routine disappears. You don't identify with it anymore. You don't depend on it anymore. You can renew yourself while in this body, and you can increase your level of choice. And this level of choice is birth or no birth. And by the time you get there, you realize you don't do this for yourself alone. In fact, you don't do this alone at all. You have a lot of beings who help you. But the responsibility is yours. And that's not the bad news, it's just the flip side of the same coin. You're not alone, but it's your own responsibility. All right? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Right over there. I, I'm really interested in the, the topic you talk, talked about, uh, uh, Zen practice and uh, psychology. Yeah. It's like an inter interaction with each other. So you said like uh, in psychology, psychologists try to fix people's problem, mental problem or something. Mostly, yes. Yeah, yeah it is. And, uh, but I have, I cannot really clearly to, you know, organize my question, but uh, main meaning is, first question is, uh, so what's, what is, what is the, how to say, uh, what is the principle of fix? I mean, who decide what is right? I mean? Well, it's a very good question, because when you feel good, that means you don't have a problem. When you feel bad, or you feel disintegrated, or you are dysfunctional, then you have a problem. So, based on the nature of the problem, we'll try to apply the patch. And once the patch is applied, then you think different, you may even feel different, you approach problems and relationships differently. And if you can uh, make that stronger than your previous habits, then you are considered fixed or healed is that it's very, very difficult to fix root problems with just conscious or verbal uh, interactive treatment. And uh, when that happens, when you see that you are moving in circles around, around the same routine, no matter what kind of patch was applied, you want to go deeper. And you say, how can I really uproot the previous habits? How can I really do something meaningful and fundamental about it without being a fundamentalist or some kind of extreme? And then you realize you have to do the job yourself. Again, you're not alone. You can have a teacher. You can have various teachers. But once you take the responsibility upon yourself, then your projected teacher comes back to you. So projection and introjection two moves. And the interjection starts with the basic teaching that all beings have Buddha nature. And 
And that means that the most important element you need for your enlightenment or awakening or taking away your bondage to the sentient being is within you. And once you know that, the whole game changes. And that's what you don't get in the West. I didn't get it 23 years ago when I was in a very critical point in my life. I really didn't know who I was. I had many chances to be anything and anyone I wanted in my life. I experienced many role personalities, the roles that I take, and the possibilities seemed to be endless. And they are endless, but who are you? What is the solid point that you can always come back to as a refuge? And it's very, very painful to say that it's nobody and nothing. In fact, it's even less than that. It's complete don't know, complete no I, completely something that is never born and never dies. And that substance is our true self. But you can't grab it. You can experience it. But you can't quantify it. You cannot put it into a form. We should be specific to it because everything is made of the same substance. But in this mic, or in this stand, or in this bottle, it's not conscious. In us, it says I. The I is not a problem. The wrong understanding or the wrong concept of I, that's the problem. So West posits that we have an I, an ego. It's almost like the Greek view of the atom before quantum physics discovered that oh, this seems to be solid, but in fact it's just a bunch of energy having this habit of being plastic, okay? So, when you realize that what we think of as a solid eye is not so solid, but inside there's a lot more stuff than we had perceived before, then you say, oh, I really don't exist in the way that I used to think. It's not something immutable, unchangeable. There's nothing actually to patch there. There are certain things to take out and certain things to supply. But there's nothing really to patch because there is no fixed cover with a hole in it. And then the other thing, the other extreme versus the I have the solid I, that I have no I, that I am nothing, that I am nobody. So that's the desert. The other is the jungle. So the desert is also wrong view. So in Zen we say, you say you have an eye, I hit you 30 times. You say you have no eye, then who's talking? Then I also hit you 30 times. Because if you had no eye, if you were nothing and nobody, then who's listening? Who's talking? So even Winnie the Pooh has this great interaction with rabbit. Do you remember that from your Winnie the Pooh reading? That's a wonderful teaching on eye. Because Winnie the Pooh one Sunday decides to pay Rabbit a visit. Does it ring a bell? Okay. So he goes over to Rabbit because that means milk and honey for him and the total devastation for Rabbit's pantry because all the reserves would just go. So Pooh knocks at Rabbit's door and says, Anybody home? Hey Rabbit, it's me. Come on. I came here for a party. And uh, Rabbit says, no, nobody home. And then, you know, Winnie the Pooh doesn't really have a supercomputer inside. But he says, hmm, nobody cannot say nobody. So there has to be somebody who says nobody. Well, who might that be? Well, it's Rabbit, come on, Rabbit, let me in. Okay? So if you say you have an eye, mistake. You say you have no eye, also mistake. What is your true self? What is your true eye? That is the question. And no one can tell you what that is. You can only find that out out of your own effort. Does this answer your question? Uh, I think you already answered my question. Um but uh, let me put it in another way because someone usually also we talked with some I talked with some therapists before. Oh, yeah. The Western therapy is just uh, 
like uh, how to say, uh, limited in ego. So they, they, they research of your ego. What, what is you? What is your background? What is your parents, your family? And uh, they try to fix you inside your ego. That's why they have Im a limitation. If the therapist is really good, or the, ther the theory itself can become really good and deep. Actually, when you do therapy, if the therapist can be very obje objective, objective like uh, the, any, any objects here, actually you can see yourself clearly, because you get back to yourself. You can see what? Now that's where the whole trick lies. You, can, you are very good with your reasoning, but what is it that you can see? What is that, really? With good therapy, if the therapist is clear or you say objective. Like that must tell me. No, don't, don't. These two are not the same. Okay. What can you see? What I can see, I, I don't know, because I never met a therapist like clear like that, but what I can see from all the objects is me, is myself. So what is this me that you can see? Right now we are one step closer. My, myself, if you say from your like a six, seven or eight consciousness. Exactly. You can, can only see. see something from one to eight. Yes, yes. But you cannot see anything beyond one and eight. That's yeah, I, really important. For that yeah, you yeah, need I a know. Zen teacher or somebody who yeah. is more than therapist. Uh, and I that's see. when this whole teaching, once you fix the sequence of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah. Once you fix the problem, because you have to fix the problem, mm -hmm. that's the eye. Mm -hmm. Fix the eye, but don't stop there. And that's when therapists usually stop, because they themselves have never made one more step. In yeah, the US, yeah, right. they also tried some. In, the, in Europe, they also tried some, but very few actually made that step in such a way that I would see. be uh, a walkable path. I see, I see. And uh, what you see by good therapy definitely belongs from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. Any of these eight consciousnesses. Yes, Great. Yes. Now, at this border, which is really the gateway to Zen or meditation, the patient becomes a practitioner. And for yeah. that, yeah, yeah. for that, the therapist has to do a job which makes therapy unnecessary. Unnecessary, but it doesn't mean that the patient who became a practitioner is already completely clear and the job is completely finished. What this means is that the therapist says, I cannot do this anymore because what I could do is done. There's nothing missing, there's nothing uh, lacking, but that's how far we could go with these methods. And now I teach you about your Buddha nature or enlightenment nature. We don't have to be religious about it. And say that if you want to do this job, then you can rely on your own energy, your own power, your own guidance, and there will be teachers in the second phase. And if the therapist is a qualified meditation teacher, then it can continue. But the relationship changes, and it has to change. It's better if it's a different teacher. Now, if I have to use a metaphor just to put it into a system, then I would use a rocket launch. Everybody remembers the retired shuttle fleet, right? Cape Canaveral is huge thing with two boosters and uh, the shuttle sitting on it. So the first is the two solid fuel rockets. That's what lifts the whole thing off. And when it reaches a certain point in the atmosphere, these two just break off, then the liquid continues, then it puts it into orbit, then this huge liquid tank also disappears, and then the shuttle is in orbit. Then it returns by its own thrusters and other mechanisms. 200,000 moving parts, we don't list them. So basically, it's the same thing. Everybody begins with a problem. Even the Buddha began with a problem. He had teachers, of yoga and uh, other you know, traditional Indian schools. But many times in this modern society, people begin with therapy because they have a psychological problem. And the best thing would be if like these solid boosters, which are very strong and very simple and uh, give adequate power and uh, security and some kind of refuge, um, the patient would realize that therapy actually works. Nobody says that it doesn't work. 
but what we should acknowledge is the limitations. But likewise, we should acknowledge the limitations of meditation practice when we do not articulate certain problems in an interactive way. Some of these have to be articulated. Some of these have to be talked about. And that's why we have, in our school, interviews. In our temple, we have Son Muntab, we have Kongan interviews, when you get the intuitive teaching as well as you can reflect your karma. So both are necessary. But none of them is perfect and complete on their own right. And I don't think the two could be or should be combined. That would result in a mule, you know, horse and, you know, donkey. Combination is a mule, sometimes very stubborn, but it's not really thoroughbred. So therapy does the therapy job, and meditation jo uh, does the meditation job. And the two can come one after the other, or even simultaneously, but not mixed. Not mixed. Otherwise, we can have a monster. Okay? So, next comes the big fuel rocket. You know, when you turn everything, again, using the metaphor, you turn this energy inwards, and then, again, more boost. And then even that is gone. That means meditation without a technique. You meditate for 5, 10, 15 years, then your mind does it, whether you sit in a lotus position or walk in the street, or you are on the chonchal, you know, on the subway, trying to squeeze yourself in and out. But the mind does the same thing. It develops the habit. So that's when the shuttle uses its own thrusters to stay on orbit, as long as it wishes and the fuel lasts. But your mind's fuel is never exhausted. Your body can be exhausted, your thinking can be tired, your feelings can be down, but your mind's original energy is never exhausted. Because that's something which is not just linked to your true self, it comes from your true self. And that's what keeps you on, even when you are dying. But if we haven't discovered it, haven't unfolded it, haven't put it to good use, then this energy is hidden or mixed or unclear. So this whole thing is energy and information together. And if we clarify that we can use it as a fantastic beam of our direction, like a beam of light which points to the way. And if you become one with that, you can never lose your way. But once we start to build up our layers of illusions and start to solidify it and believe in it, etc., etc., then this sentient life seems to whirl and go around, around, around because you lost your center. You went to the periphery. You started to believe in something else as yourself. That's why the question, what am I? What are we? What is this? And as you use this question, all these layers of illusion start to peel off. And sometimes you just want to grab, no, 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 please, 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 don't go, don't go. It's gone. Because you asked the right question. So the illusion is gone. You want to know your true self? That's what you get. You don't, then you don't. Nothing is on autopilot here. That's the good news. But, and there's no bad news. But you have to use your own energy to make choices and your own decision, your own information to make choices. And one choice is to ask a certain question. And once you do that, your mind will never be the same as before. Even if the question is just a little dent on your notion of reality or yourself. All right? You. Wonderful. Thank you. More questions? first here just for geographical reasons and then we hand it over to this very quick gentleman thank you uh, okay. uh, so I've been Buddhist for uh, long years and I have a question about do we all reborn or is there a heaven or hell um, if you want to find heaven, where would you go? He said, Kungnaksege. Well, where it's is Kungnaksege? Uh, we don't reborn or we just. Uh, we understand. The, I'm sorry. We yeah. understand the properties of Kungnaksege. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Yes. We exist just in a kind of light state and we don't have to be reborn. But where is it? That's my question. Where? Oh. Uh, Somewhere in, in, not here. 
not somewhere here. in up there or up up how far up <laughs> how far up well just the imagination uh uh now you're wrong yeah if it's Im imagination it's illusion but we're not talking about illusion we're talking about the real state of mind which is called guknak sege or pure land so this pure land is actually a state of mind. If you look for that state of mind, do you have to go somewhere? Uh, I don't know. Now we have a heaven or a hell, but yeah, uh, after good. death. Very but after good. death, my Very question. Good. So if you don't know now whether we have heaven or hell, then what happens later? How will you find it? How do we find? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I suggest a question for you. Where do heaven and hell come from? Work with it. Work with it. When you see this space here, when you see the brown floor, the beautiful lights, and the golden Buddha statues, is there heaven or hell in it? No. Correct. No. Yeah. You may say something else happens when we leave this body and you, we, we may find ourselves in this yeah. oh, Wow, I didn't really know that this happens to me, etc. Mm. How do you decide where to go? I don't know. I just want to know. How do you decide which exit you take at Dongukde, you know, Choncholiog? How do you decide that? Uh, it's a six sign outside. Yeah. So for that exit, you need a sign. Inside your mind, how do you decide whether you want to go to hell, heaven, or somewhere else? How do you decide that? Being good or bad. Ah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good one, although you are using good and bad, in the case of heaven and hell question, it's relevant. Good people go to heaven, we believe, Bad people go to hell, we believe. Well, our concept of good and our concept of bad warrants that something happens. That's clear. But whether our goodness takes us to the heaven we imagine, that remains to be seen. Because whatever you imagine, you are here on earth. The badness also, we believe, takes you to hell. But do you have to wait for that hell until you die? Some people do bad actions and it's right there. Some people do good actions and it's also amazingly, clearly, immediately right there. So if I say that heaven and hell are born from your mind, would that be too far-fetched? So we make heaven and hell with our own consciousness and speech and feelings and actions. So how do you have this sign in your mind? We talked about the vows, we talked about the importance of speech. Why do we recite the four great vows? Why do we recite the sutras? Just that we would be good Buddhists? No. Then we would be just a kind of museum attendant. Attendants who are taking care of the Buddhist museum. And we are not doing just that. We are conducting a mind practice. And this mind practice takes us somewhere. So direction, 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 as you've heard before. So if your direction with your speech, with your thinking, with your feelings, and with your actions, all the four most important parts, they point as a result somewhere. So wherever your mind points, wherever your actions, your speech, your feelings, your thinking, wherever they point. And you see, that's why we have the vows. That's why we have our conduct, our practice, our effort, so that they would point to the same direction. And this kind of direction is many times. We think different, and we speak something else, and our feelings are also different, and we do a fourth thing with our actions. Now, where do we go? Where do we really? We don't know. Then we really don't know. So that's why. Wherever your mind takes you, that's where you go. Don't think that heaven and hell are outside of you, like a destination. You can think like that, 
but it's very basic. That's the kindergarten level, which is good. Kindergarten is something we all go through. Very, very necessary. But the adult level is, come on, we make the whole thing. We make it. So what do we make? Moment to moment, what do we make? Moment to moment, what kind of thinking, what kind of speech, what kind of feeling, what kind of action? So moment to moment, we make this happen. So I'm sorry to say, there is no right and left door in that sense, like two extremes. But we have consequences with our actions, speech, thinking and feelings. That is also very, very clear. All right? So, watch this moment. Look inside. Then you find everything. More questions over there? All right, so this is kind of related to what you just mentioned, but in the room in my mind, there's a hundred people. Let's say I know five. If, if, like you said, I get to know all the people in the room, how do I gather them all, uh, gather them all up and say, let's go this way, guys? It doesn't work with just one command. First, you have to understand what's really going on, what kind of tendencies you have. This kind of 5 slash 95 is really your own hidden powers and hidden potentials and hidden dangers versus those that you already know. So first of all, you have to see their face, their, their faces. And once you know what they are, then you have a better knowledge of your own character, that you're capable of this, incapable of that. In the hundred, you don't have an accountant, but in the hundred, you have five soldiers. So that's the meaning of this. So you really have to understand yourself, not just as an internal mind practice, but also trying yourself in various situations. Some of these situations, like the Kongan teaching in our interviews, are virtual. But this virtual can be really good testing ground. And then you can try yourself in various other situations when uh, when you really give yourself a chance to show something which you have not seen before from yourself, and then you know who you are, you know who the 95 are. Um, but basically, just like with any crowd, you have to find the leader. You have to find the strongest, the most powerful, because the, that controls the rest. You have to find the boss or your own master, and that master controls the rest of it. So one word, and everyone follows. But not everybody's word is like that. So what is your true master? Which one? And I can tell you it's not in the 100. Uh -uh. Who's looking for the 100? Who's looking among the 100? So that master is not the kind of biggest gangster in the block. That's not the point. It's just, you know, various karmic chunks, you know, some, some karma stronger, some karma weaker. But what is it that controls all the karma? Now, that's not karma. It's something beyond that. In fact, that's the source and end of all your karma. A wonderful Western teacher said 2,000 years ago, your true self is the alpha and the omega. In your true self, there is the beginning and the end. So that's where this ultimate word comes from, and then everyone follows. Everyone. But for that, you have to find this. Find this entity. Because anyone else just sparks a debate. Sometimes we have this mind chatter. Should I go eat kibimbap? Bibimbap? No, I want to eat kab. No, don't cut. No, uh, let's say. Mm. Maybe go to Paribagat. No, I want to go to Holy Scoff. You know, I don't know. So this kind of mind chatter is like the 95 plus the 5 talking, 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 talking all the time. But then there's a moment of silence or some kind of switch and just one thing, decision. And it's decided all of a sudden, right away. And most of the time we don't know where that thing comes from. And it's correct, we don't know that. You cannot know it because that's what knows. You cannot put light over light. You cannot see your eyes and cannot hear your ears. This is just a gateway. It's not your visual consciousness. It's just something necessary for it. So the more you practice this what am I 
question, or what is this? What is this that's breathing? What is this that's listening in you right now? Then the more you get down to the depth of your creative level, where actually the beginnings and ends are. And sometimes this surfaces in the most unexpected ways. I verily remember how some of my decisions came about. And uh, that one impulse came seemingly out of nowhere. And nobody talked to me. Least of all God or Buddha. Nobody talked to me. But something surfaced in my consciousness, seemingly out of nothing and nowhere. And it seemed to be the truest thing, the most valid thing, the best thing that I could ever do. And it was tested and tried over the last couple of decades many times. And everyone has that source inside. Everyone. The question is, do you dig down to it? Do you discover it? Do you use it? And if so, for what? Does this answer your question? Uh, could it be that that source you're talking about, that boss, could it be what many religions refer to as God? or? Well, what is God? There, there are so many definitions. You can fill a whole library with it. What is God? We can sit here until tomorrow morning and still we haven't finished discussing this and this and this and this view. At this point, I don't know what is God. For me, this don't know is God, but it's also Buddha, and it's no God and no Buddha at the same time. So, what religions think about God for me is unimportant, but do they attain God, and in that, do we attain our true self, our true master? That is the question. Because we can call it in any way. There are many wonderful Buddhists who believe in Buddha, believe in Buddha, but they don't get enlightenment. The same thing as believing God, but never attaining God. So, uh, as long as it's a projection, something externalized, you will never get it. You have to realize where that projection comes from. And then the introjection of a teacher can be very helpful. Because you have a teacher personality who you trust, and you discover that teacher inside, and you take some of that into yourself. That's what we call introjection. So we can have various concepts, God, Buddha, or you can work out another word for the same thing. But it's the same dilemma. In English we say I, in French we say je, in German we say ich, uh, in Korean there is a lot. But all these words point to the same thing, but what is that? Ultimately we don't know what that is, but what we know is that it doesn't depend on words. It doesn't matter in how many languages you say that, but it's one thing. Now find that. Not what we think about it, not what we are conditioned to believe about it, but what it truly is, and that helps. More questions? Last two questions. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask is, uh, I have been wondering for quite a long time about this question, actually. So, uh, we call in southern part, like uh, uh, like uh, in uh, Thailand, or we call southern uh, Buddhism and North Buddhism, like us, like uh, Zen Buddhism. Somehow, we have like a sudden awakening and a gradual awakening. So, like they practice southern part, they practice in uh, in the way you gradually to be enlightened. Somehow we call that. Yeah. And here we call like a sudden enlightening. So I don't know. I think awakening is awakening. How can you be graduate awakened or you sudden awaken? I mean, so what's the difference or similarity? Or should I say, should I say what is the, the point we can say, OK, this person enlightened. This is not. So I don't know the difference. These are two questions. The first is, what is the point in saying somebody is enlightened or not? I don't touch that. It's, it's really not important. The second is sudden or gradual. Now, there was a big debate in Lhasa in 899. There's tons of books about it. You can read into it. And uh, I want to your, know your, your opinion. Not <laughs> I don't want to know scholars' opinion. I want to know your opinion. Bear with me two sentences. 
That's when sudden and gradual were separated. But if you read the sixth patriarch, Henung Sunim, he is brilliant about this. And he says, in your true self, in your true face, there is no time or space, sudden or gradual. How can you talk about these things in a complete state of non-duality? So if you approach it from a dualistic perspective, then there is sudden and gra gradual, because some people get it like in one year, then six years, like the Buddha, then some people practice for 20 years, and then they are considered enlightened. But the standards for cons being considered enlightenment is just so vast, that's why we don't touch the question. So the Korean, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Tibetan, the Sri Lankan, and the Taiwanese and the Thai standards of enlightenment depend so much on their methodology, the way they define that, that we just cannot go into that. But if we become independent of these methods, you can say the person who has no more anger, desire, and ignorance, completely free from the bondage of uh, being a sentient being, who is beyond life and death while in this body, you can consider that enlightened. So it's a very loose definition and very metaphysical. And getting back to sudden and uh, gradual, is the is the result of a politically heated theological debate, and we don't have to concern ourselves with it. The question is, do you practice at this moment? That's the real question. Out of that comes a sudden awakening experience or the gradual processing and letting go of your karma. Now, you can approach it from various angles, but if I may go deeper into the scholarly jungle for two sentences, Nagarjuna is great, because any time you have a dualistic type of question, Nagarjuna's four negations are a great help. So, the central issue that we are trying to touch here is a gradual, sudden, both gradual and sudden, neither gradual nor sudden. So that kind of helps you patch this up in such a way that you will never think of sudden and gradual as something absolute. But you can use that whether you talk about the karma which is gradually processed or something like boom and that's relatively a sudden experience. But in the whole there is no such thing as sudden or gradual. When you don't think is there sudden or gradual? When you keep your mind completely unmoving, without thinking, infinite time, infinite space, is there sudden or gradual? Not possible. So, I sincerely appreciate your wonderful attention. I know that the subject is not too easy. And uh, I really hope to see uh, most of you in this place um, in late September. And uh, I promise that the subject will be different from therapy, meditation, and uh, Western and Eastern. We stop this uh, loop of comparisons, and now we will go into other subjects which might be very interesting for you. Thank you for your attention.